thing in our minds when we think about what is the church. And most of us don't think about the church through the lens of Scripture, but through the mindset of what's been handed on to us through culture for the past 2,000 years, for the past 1,700 years. And so we need a paradigm shift. We need a new perspective of what is the church. And sometimes you've just got to break it down all the way to its foundations and build back up based upon Scripture. And so we're, we're doing that. What is, what is the church? What is the church? And so through, a, through a, several different uh, dreams, some visions, prophetic words, the Lord has you know, really made it clear to me and to the elders that we're to do a series on uh, divine order. God is releasing a greater apostolic function to bring divine order to restoration life. And I shared a dream about this a couple weeks ago. I'll share it in another message, not today. But this divine order will bring forth a greater corporate expression of the indwelling life of Christ together so that we can learn how to flow in his life together as a body. And my prayer as we start this series is that this series would be revelationary. Okay, revelationary. If you look that up in the dictionary, you'll not find the definition. That's a Brianism. Revelationary, that it would bring revelation to you that would bring a revolution to how we do and think about church. Revelationary, that God would give us a revelation that would break through the mindsets, and all of us have mindsets of what church is. And we would get back onto the biblical blueprint, the biblical pattern of what Paul revealed, mainly Paul revealed, of what the New Testament church is meant to be and to look like and to function in divine order. So my prayer is this would be revelationary, that it would bring revelation that leads to revolution in how we do church, how we think of ourselves as the body of Jesus Christ. You don't just go to church, you are the church. You don't just go to church in a two-hour service to hear some music and hear a message that's relevant. You are the body of Christ, and we are, ga we are literally gathering under the headship of Jesus Christ when we come together each Sunday. And so may, may God bring a, a shift in our mentality, a shift in our thinking, because if we don't have revelation of the church, we will do what the church, has, church leaders have done for 1,700 years since Constantine is we will institutionalize, formalize, organize, traditionalize, systematize any eyes you can think of to the church just like has been going on throughout history. We must have God's revelation. And so I want to pray as we get started for that, that we would get, that God would do a work so that we could start this series with a blank sheet of paper and we could say, Lord, Okay, I have ideas about the church. I have ideas. Some are scriptural. Some are not scriptural. Lord, may I start? We, may we start this series with a blank sheet of paper and say, God, teach us what the New Testament church is meant to look like. Amen? Let's just pray for that. Lord, I am asking you today that you would give us a revelation. Lord, give us a revelation of what Paul had in mind when you gave him the revelation of the mystery of Christ the body. Lord, I know we all know a lot of this stuff and it's some of it's revelation, but I pray that where it's knowledge, it would become revelation. Lord, where it's just in the mind, it would become living and active so our eyes are opened, Lord, I pray, to see this church, the church, the local church through the eyes of Scripture, through the eyes of God's eternal purpose, so that we could be the living, breathing expression of Jesus Christ in, the, in this city, in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is where we're going today in this message. As I want to ask the question, what is the church? What does it mean to be the church? You know, specifically, this message is going to explain that, and I, we've talked about this before, but the church, but we got to hear it over and over because it gets into our mind, is we think the church is a place you go every Sunday to hear uplifting music and a relevant message. 
instead of seeing the church as an interdependent body, the very body of Jesus Christ on the earth, who together expresses the indwelling life together in divine order. So that's where we're going. And so there, I'm going to talk, I'm going to do four things in this message. I'm going to explain God's eternal purpose for the church. In other words, this is not just like a good idea or a man's idea. This was, uh, this was part of the reason for God creating us is because he had the church in mind when he created this earth. It was part of God's eternal purpose. Number two, I want to describe what it means for Christ to be the head of the church, what it means for us to be the body, and then what it means for the fullness of Christ to be expressed corporately through the church. See, the fullness of Christ. We've got to have a vision for the fullness of Christ. Oh, we've got to have a vision for that. Number three, I want to help deconstruct Western Christianity's unbiblical view of the church because no matter how much we try and no matter how much we say we don't believe the church is this organized thing. It still gets into our minds that we go to church and we're spectators, not participators. And so I want to help deconstruct that unbiblical view that has been passed down for 1,700 years since Constantine so we can fully embrace God's eternal purpose for the church. And then number four, I want to distinguish between consumer Christianity which is we go to church to get, we go to church to feel better, we go to church to hear and learn. Now, there's, there is a place for that for sure. Instead of, and I'm going to change, help change the paradigm to see, no, we go to church to give. Like Paul's talked about in 1 Corinthians 4.26, when you gather, each one of you is to bring a word, a psalm, a hymn, a revelation, a tongue, it's not, see, if I was to ask you, how long did you spend in prayer this week for what you would bring this Sunday, I would be incredibly discouraged because no one probably would have sought that. Now, you know, I don't blame you. I, I didn't, when Michael was preaching, I didn't either. So I'm speaking to myself as well, is that we get in this mindset where we go as a consumer, and it's part of our culture. It's part of living in the American culture of an entertainment, capitalist-based culture of going to consume products, and we, we go, we, without even realizing it, we go to church with a consumer mindset of how is this going to be? How, how you know, really this entertainment mindset, spiritual entertainment of, well, how was the music? How was the message? You know, how, you know, and we, we get into this mindset of really consumer Christianity, which is everywhere in the American church. It's really everywhere around the world, but especially in America, this, this entertainment, capitalistic culture has so affected our minds, we think church is this place you go instead of a people, a body, the very body of Jesus Christ on the earth, who together is expressing his life together. And I believe if we can capture the vision, God's vision for the church, and really have that revelation, it would change so much about church, so much about the way we view church. Um, and so that's where we're going today in this message. So let's talk about first God's eternal purpose for the church. And let, let me read Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, and then Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27. And I want to just compare these two verses of Scripture and show you real quick that the church was in the heart of God in eternity past. Ephesians 1, 5 is Paul is writing, and he says that he, says that he predestined us. Hold on, hold on, that's not it. It's uh, Ephesians uh, 1, 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless. Now, some people read this, Calvinists especially read this, and they think, they don't read it as chose us, but they read it as chose me. They, they take it from the corporate to the individual 
and say, God chose, if I'm saved, I'm part of the elect, God chose me. I was, I was chosen by God before eternity to be saved, and the others were chosen not to be saved, and they were, they were basically damned before even creation began. And I believe what Paul is saying here is not the individual that God had chosen before the foundation of the world. It's the church who was chosen in Christ. Just like Adam, just like Adam, Eve was, in the, it was inside of Adam when he was born. And Adam, when he was created, and Adam had to be put to sleep and God had to take his rib out to form Eve. The church before the foundation of the world was in Christ. It was always God's eternal plan for the church. Now, let me explain to you why I believe it's talking about the church being chosen and not individuals. Now, we're chosen as we place our faith in Jesus Christ. We're, we're then become part of the church so that we become part of the elect that God has chosen. But I want to show you this here in Ephesians 5, um, verse 27. It's the same exact language Paul has um, in this scripture. He says that he might present to himself, what? The church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. You see the similarity between Ephesians 1, 4. We were chosen in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. Ephesians 5, 27 worked out into time that we would be holy and blameless. That's why when I believe that Paul's talking about the us, he's not just merely talking about individuals who were elect or chosen before the foundation of the world. He's talking about the church. The church is God's eternal purpose. The church was in the heart of God before time and creation, what God wanted for the church. And how much man has come in to mess up God's eternal plan and purpose to create an organization, to create an institution, to create a religion rather than the living expression of the life of Christ in a people who are filled with Christ, who, who function and live together in love and unity and express his life beautifully together as a local body, the, the fullness of Christ in a given city or the, in, in a given location. The fullness of Christ, that's what God is aiming for in all of this. So this is God's plan from the very beginning. Now flip back over to Ephesians chapter 1. Really the whole book of Ephesians, Paul wrote this whole book to unveil the eternal plan and purpose of God. That was Paul's purpose for writing the book of Ephesians. Is he wanted to unveil the plan and the, the eternal plan and purpose of God. In Ephesians 1.22, Paul said he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him, he's talking about Christ, and gave him as head over all things to the church. This is so beautiful, verse 23, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. What Paul is doing now is revealing the eternal purpose of God what God plans, what God purposes, what ought to be. This is like, the, this is what ought to be. It's not what is right now. This is what ought to be and what will be before the Lord returns. He will have a church. I mean, would, would you say the church around the world is currently expressing, is currently expressing this verse, a church that is filled with the fullness of Christ? I would say absolutely not. It's filled with carnality. It's filled with man. It's filled with humanism and soulishness, demons even. Now, not all the church. I'm not going to paint this terrible, horrible picture that everything's that bad, but a lot of it is pretty bad, okay? A lot of, you know, God's doing a cleansing work before the second coming of Jesus Christ, but God will have. This is what we got to understand about eschatology, the end times, is Jesus is not just going to, Jesus is not, I don't believe Jesus is going to return until God gets what he's always wanted, which is based on his eternal plan and purpose, that he would have a bride, he would have a church that is without spot, stain, or wrinkle. So God is going to move before the second coming of Christ to get what he wants. 
And what does he want? Paul tells us what ought to be right here. It's a people. It's a body who have the fullness of Christ. Christ filling them unto fullness. Christ filling you unto fullness. Christ filling me unto fullness. And that together as a body, I mean, think about the beautiful picture of this. What would it look like, even in this small church, if all of us were filled with the fullness of Christ and then we came together filled with the fullness of Christ as a body and we were joined together as a living stones into a place where God then filled this place with the fullness of Christ. That should be our goal. That's where we are headed. That's where God wants for the church. That's his eternal plan and his eternal purpose. It's a beautiful vision. It's a beautiful vision, the church as it ought to be. Now, let me just break about, apart this um, three, three statements in this scripture that Paul talked about that he gave him as head over all things to the church. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. What we're talking about here is the lordship of Jesus Christ. We're talking about the supreme lordship of Jesus Christ. That there really is no such thing as a church where Jesus Christ is not the supreme Lord. He is Lord. He is King. Every knee will bow to him. He is the head of the church. But the head without a body can't function. Christ needs a body to express his life through. But Jesus Christ as the head is telling us that Jesus is the source he is the life. He is the nourishment. He is the guidance. So we've got to hear, everything hinges on hearing his voice. Lord, what are you speaking? Lord, you know, we, we study the scriptures to know what has God said. We get into communion to know what is God saying. We need both. We need to build our lives on what has God said, the scriptures. We need to live our lives from that foundation. What is God saying? What is, God, what is God's voice saying to the church? We, mu we must hear the voice of God in the operation of the church. We've got to hear his voice. Thank thankfully, Dad's book, the Learning to Hear God's Voice, is so powerful to lay those principles out of how to hear the voice of God because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Is, is that living communion of living this place of intimacy with the Lord, where we hear the Lord's voice. And then from that place, we're taking orders from the head. We're not here just to gather together and, you know, for me to preach and us to hear do some music and whatever. We're here under the headship of Jesus Christ. That's why a couple, about a year ago, we were saying that prayer, Lord, we come to you. We say, Jesus, you are the head and we are your body. And we come to you to submit ourselves under the headship of Jesus Christ. The elders are, are continually yielding ourselves to him and saying, Lord, we are not, we are leading this based upon you. We're not doing this for any other reason because you're the head. We're not the head. You're the head. We want to be submitted to you. We want to be submitted to the government of God, not the government of man. So, Lord, you're the head, not us. And so Paul talked about that we are to grow up unto, into him who is the head. A lot of the church is waiting to go up in the rapture. God wants the church to grow up unto him who is the head. Maturity in Christ is vital. We are to grow up into him who is the head. God wants to bring forth a mature man. God does not want, uh, God does not want us to remain in our childish immaturity forever. God wants us to grow up unto him who is the head. Next, uh, the next thing Paul said here is the church, which is his body. The church is not an organization. 
The church is not a service. The church is not a place you go. The church is not a two-hour event where you hear music and listen to a message. Give your money. Go home. Take a nap. Eat. That's not church. Church is, listen, church is the body. See, whatever comes, whatever comes into your mind when you think of the church, let it be this, the number one thing. The church is his body. See, so many churches out there are trying to, to have these events and these services geared towards those who are unbelievers towards the lost, and they gather the lost in and present you know, try to present relevant messages to them to lead them to Christ. Now, I'm not saying there's not a place for that, but that's not the church. The church is his body. The church are those members who have his life. The church is those who have been baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. And if you don't have Christ in you, you're not part of the church. If Christ is not in you, you don't, you're not his. You don't belong to his body. So we've got to make this understanding... And so what does Paul mean by the church is his body? Now, let's, let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, where Paul makes an amazing statement. You've got to get this statement. Just let it just, wow. I mean, he's talking about the operation of the body. He's talking about the operation of the body and spiritual gifts. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, for even as the body is one, he's talking about the natural human body, my human body, your human body. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, that they are many, are one body. Now he says the body, the human body, is a, is a metaphor of Christ. And he says, so also is Christ. Now catch this. The body of Christ, you and me, is Christ. Now that does not mean we're little gods. That does not mean we're, you know, little GODs floating around, little Christ. What it's saying is because we are now a partaker of the divine nature through the indwelling Holy Spirit. And what it's saying is because now in Christ you have been regenerated. Now in Christ your spirit is joined to the Holy Spirit. In Christ now your heart has been washed clean. Now in Christ you are joined to the Holy Spirit and your spirit has been regenerated and has now righteous and holy and Christ-like and complete. All we talked about in the indwelling life, Paul is saying that you are an, exp you are an expression of Christ. Now, what he's really at looking towards is the corporate. We've got to get this understanding. In America, we're so individually minded. We're so independent. It's just part of our culture. I mean, the Declaration of Independence. Is, from the very beginning of America, we are independent people. We're not going to be ruled by anyone. And it's created this individualism, this independence that's foreign to the Scriptures. When God's talking, he's normally almost always talking to the corporate. What God wants to do, he wants to do corporately, not just individually. And so what Paul's saying here is, we are one body, so also is Christ. Christ is his body. That's a profound statement that I don't think we really get. I think it just, we're just so used to like go to church for two hours, da, 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 da. Christ is his body. That's what Paul's saying here. We, because we have the indwelling life of Jesus Christ, we are literally the expression of Christ in the earth, the church is. Us here at Restoration Life are a local expression of the very life of Christ in Kennesaw. See, you, we probably don't think about that. I mean, how many of you thought about that when you were coming to church today, when you were coming to gather, I guess you should say? I'm a living, breathing expression of Jesus Christ in the earth. No, we're probably like, okay, 
you know, get the kids in the car, get things packed up, get the food and the snacks we need, what's our plans afterwards, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then we're rushing to church. We don't even think twice. I am the living, breathing expression of Christ coming together as a living stone to be that member that expresses his life together interdependently. We're just racing to get here on time so the pastor, whoever he is, doesn't get mad at me for not being here on time. We're just, you know, racing to get here. We don't think, and Paul's to say, oh, wait, we're coming under the headship of Jesus Christ. We literally are the expression of Jesus Christ as his body. Now think about this. When Saul, Paul, was persecuting Jesus and he was going around to the church thinking he was doing an act of God and he was uh, persecuting the church, the early church, he was killing Christians because he thought they were in blasphemy. He has this encounter on the road to Damascus where the Lord appears to him in a glorious vision, knocks him off his horse. I, I think, I haven't read the text lately, I think he knocked him off his horse or at least he was, he was blinded by the glory of Jesus Christ. And the Lord said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you, per listen to this, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Wait a second here. What? what? Paul said, you're persecuting me. I, no, I'm not persecuting you. I'm persecuting those people who are following the way, those people who say they're the church. Look at that. That's the way Jesus views his body. You're persecuting me. The ecclesia, which is the Greek word for church, the ecclesia is Christ. His very body in the earth, the very expression of Jesus Christ in the earth. Isn't that a, like entirely different way of viewing what this is we do on Sunday? Why are you persecuting me? You see the same thing in the parable of the sheep and the goats when the Lord returns and he says to those who took care of those in prison, those who were you know, naked and needed clothing, those who were hungry and needed to be fed, he says, to the least you've done it unto me, un unto these little ones, my brethren, the least, the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. The body of Christ is Christ. The body of Christ is Christ on the earth. Again, this does not mean we're little Christ. It does not mean we're little gods. It does not mean any of that, that heresy that has been taught before. But it does mean we literally have the very presence of Jesus Christ through the indwelling Holy Spirit as a partaker of the divine nature. I have him. You have him. And that when we come together, if we will be a people that will say, God, fill me with the fullness of Jesus Christ, think of what we could become when we gather together. That mature man who's expressing the very life of Jesus Christ. Now let's turn to 1 Corinthians 10.32. Are you still with me here? I, I, I'm excited about this. Some, some of you are all like, uh, hopefully you're processing and not bored. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10.32, give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Now, based on this statement, the early church used to refer to themselves as the third race. The Jews, the Gentiles, and the church of God. The third race. I think that's biblically accurate. We are an entirely, the church is an entirely new creation. The same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells inside of you. The same spirit who acted upon the words of Christ, let there be light, and formed the heavens, formed the sun, lives inside of you, lives inside of me. We are, we are, we are the, the, the church of Jesus Christ is this third race, this entirely new creation, the very expression of Christ, his hands and his feet on the earth. 
It's like when Jesus ascended to heaven. The book of Acts starts off and it says, all that Jesus began to do and teach in the book of Acts. What does that mean? It means Jesus is continuing to do and to teach through his body on the earth who is filled with his spirit. See, coming back to this very foundation helps change the paradigm that's so hardwired into us of thinking, I go to church. I go to church. And of thinking, okay, I'm going to church to be a spectator rather than a participator. I'm going to church to listen rather than to hear God and, you know, you know share. Like we had a great example today where Drew heard the Lord, you know, texted me, and I, we shared it corporately. So God wants us to begin to think, okay, well, Lord, what are you saying as we gather today? Here's a prayer we were praying, um, I don't know, it was probably six months, a year ago, for a while, just to help sink this into us. And I just encourage us just to think this way, Lord Jesus Christ, you are the head of the church, and you are the head of this church. We as your body, your ecclesia, we come under your headship together. That's what we're doing on Sunday. We're coming under the headship of Jesus Christ together to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, to express your life together, to love, encourage, and care for one another, and to follow you wherever you go. That's the church. That's the church. That's what the church is meant to be. Going back to Ephesians 1, where Paul was talking about we are his church, the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let me just break down the, uh, the, this phrase, the fullness of him. Just catch this, please. The fullness of him who fills all in all. Oh, man, that is an incredible statement. This is church as God intends. It's not really... Accurate. There's probably nowhere in, in the world where this is actually fully, ultimately fulfilled, where the fullness of Christ is filling a people all in all. This is God, as God intends, and I believe as God will do before the Lord returns. He will accelerate this purpose. But this is really what God wants to do here is the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Paul says this. Think about this phrase, in all. He says, in all. In other words, he's saying the church is only the church, the body is only the body, you're only a member of the body if Christ is in you. If Christ is, in you, is not in you, you are not part of the body. That's why there's so many of these mega churches out there drawing in crowds that hardly, I don't know the percentage, I have no idea, God knows. It's probably not a high percentage in my opinion. That you really can't say that's the church because Christ doesn't even dwell in many of them. They're just church attenders. God knows, not I, but obviously. But the church is those who have Christ in them. The next thing Paul says here is Paul says, who fills all. God's burden is that his people, we, would be a people who are filled with Christ, filled with Christ. God, help us to be a people who are filled with Christ. When this happens, the fullness of Christ is expressed throughout the earth. When this happens in this local church, the fullness of Christ will be expressed in this local body. See, the greatest thing you can do as a man or a woman is to be a person who is filled with Christ. You'll be a better mother and father. You'll be a better employee. You'll be a better friend. You'll be a better husband or wife. You'll be so much better when Christ is filling you. In all, filling all. And it's pretty simple, but it's hard. I mean, it's a simple concept to understand the real life application of this in everyday life, in the everyday cares of life is hard to work out. 
but may we become those people who are filled with Christ, that Christ in us would increase and self would decrease. I want to read this quote by T. Austin Sparks, and Quentin will show the slide here, or McKenzie, um, that he said, he said this statement that the object of the Father from first to last is that the Son, the Lord Jesus, shall fill all things, and all things shall be filled with Christ. The value of everything in the eyes of God is according to the measure of the manifestation of Christ in it. What's called the church doesn't have a lot of value in the eyes of God. It's Christ that has value. And it is from that standpoint that God determines the value of the thing. How much of the Lord Jesus is manifested through that and that determines the value from God's standpoint. <laughs> that is an incre- I wish I would have written that. That is an incredible statement. Let me just summarize it real quick for us. Is the Father's eternal purpose is for His Son to fill everything. God wants to fill everything. And He wants for every person to be filled with Christ. See, Jesus said, I came... Why did he come? There was an eternal purpose driving his coming. He came not just to die for salvation. I came that you would have life, Zoe life, his life, his indestructible life, his overcoming life, his resurrection life, his very divine life, the Zoe life of God in you. I came that you would have life. And you would have that life in abundance, filling you, expressing it himself through you as life. That does not mean when Jesus came, like it's taught in the prosperity gospel, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. That does not mean I came to give you your best life now. It does not mean I came so you could be prosperous, you could have a great car, a great house, and do great things financially. God's not opposed to prosperity. That's just not what that is saying. That's, God's eternal purpose was not to come and bless you. God's eternal purpose was to put his life in you. That is what God's plan and purpose is, is he wants to be the life in you and for that life to fill you all the way to fullness in abundance. See, from God's perspective, just, just let's, let's let this sink in. From God's perspective, the worth of anything doesn't mean he doesn't love you, but the value and the worth of anything is determined by how much it is filled with Christ and reveals Christ. That's going to be the standard at the judgment seat of Christ. The value, the plumb line of God's judgment is, are you filled with Christ? Did you reveal Christ? Did you do what Christ said to do? Or did you do things and ask Christ to bless it? What God doesn't initiate, God does not appreciate. That's what a quote from Terry Bennett. Bennett. Everything we do must have its origins in God or else it has no value to the Lord. It is Christ from beginning to the end. The value in the word, again, this does not mean God does not love you. It does not mean that God doesn't want you in your personality to be an expression of his life. But what it means is that that God is not impressed with the things we do for him. God is impressed with Christ. That's what, Christ, that's what the Father is in, in, impressed by, is Christ. Is he seeing the Son being formed in you, in your heart, in your soul, in your body, what you do, how you live from his life? I mean, think about the church, if that's really the standard. And I'm just saying about the church around the world and all that we're seeing, the church and the nations would be an abomination because the church and the nations, for the most part, by and large, I'm not saying there's always a remnant. There's always those hidden ones we don't see. 
But by and large, the church around the world is not filled with Christ and expressing Christ. There's so many who are focused on the things of Christ rather than the person of Christ. And everything that God wants us to do should flow out of our focus and our obsession with the person of Christ, out of our relationship, all the other things come into balance. The standard by which God assesses the value of anything is the extent to which Christ fills it and is revealed through it. So that would apply to us as well, that the, va- the value God sees at Restoration Life Church is, do I see Christ? Do I see Christ being formed in a people? Do I see Christ filling a people? Do I see Christ expressing himself through a people? And may we get back into that, that alignment with what God says is most valuable to him. Ephesians 1.10, Paul was talking again about the, the eternal purpose of God. And he says that God had a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. Basically what this means is God's plan is to complete his work in the earth. He will complete that during the millennial kingdom when he sums up All things in the nations, governments, every single thing in culture, government, finances, education, the healthcare system, all of every single thing you see in culture, entertainment, God is going to sum all of that and bring it under the headship of Jesus Christ when he returns. God is going to carry that and extend it into the universe and the eternal ages. But now in this age we live in, God's eternal purpose for this age right now, catch this, is that God would fill a people with Christ who would be fully submitted to Christ. And Christ would be their all in all. And Christ would fill them and they would reveal Christ to a, to an, uh, a people who desperately need him as salt and light in the earth. I believe before the Lord returns... You know, we can look at all these different signs and we can see, you know, we, I mean, obviously they are never before in history have more signs, I, I believe, have more signs been in alignment for what the, the scriptures say or will be fulfilled before the Lord comes back in terms of end time events than right now. Israel being a nation, all the technology that we see, the go- global government rising up. Um, all these things that, that Scripture says had to be in place before the Lord returns, those things are happening at a very rapid pace. But one thing that is essential that will determine the, really the linchpin, the catalyst for his return, is, is, the, is the church rising up in readiness to be a corporate expression of Christ in fullness. Because if God planned all this from the very beginning, he's not coming until he sees he gets what he wants. That should drive our end time views. The fullness of Christ is revealed in the book of Ephesians. Paul mentions fullness four times. Three times are focused on the fullness of Christ and the people. Well, I just want us to, to really get this. May the burden of the Lord come upon us as that Lord we don't want to be, we don't want to have the fullness of self. We don't want to be filled with self, what I want, when I want, how I want it, and how I want it done. That profits nothing. It's of no value to God, even though God loves you. God is, is jealous for the fullness of Christ to be revealed. Paul said in Ephesians 1.23 that the, we talked about this, that the fullness of that Paul used fullness to reveal God's ultimate intention for the church. In Ephesians 3.19, Paul used fullness in a prayer that we've prayed often. I encourage you to pray it both individually and corporately that God would strengthen you in your inner man with his power and with his might so that you might be filled, so that you might be strengthened and Christ might dwell in your heart so that you would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you would be, I love this, you would be filled with all the fullness of God. 
See, not only is the fullness God's ultimate intention, but the fullness was a prayer that motivated Paul to stand in the gap and to cry out, Lord, bring fullness to these people. And then in Ephesians 4.13, Paul used fullness to show what is the goal of fivefold ministry. The goal of fivefold ministry is for God to raise up a mature man, Ephesians 4.13, oh, with this burn in leaders' hearts. God's goal is not to establish your kingdom. God's goal is not to establish your ministry. God's goal is not to build your platform or give you influence. God's eternal goal is to have a mature man, one new man, one corporate man, one man who is expressing the man's very life, Jesus Christ. A mature man who has grown up into all things into him who is the head. And then Paul says in Ephesians 4.13, "...the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ." This is why those in full-time ministry, and not even, you don't have to be in full-time ministry, but this is why those who God has appointed apostles and prophets and teachers pastors and evangelists to the church is because God is jealous to raise up a mature representation of his son in the earth. And he's jealous that we would not build a church with fingerprints of man all over it. I'm building this for my kingdom and my purposes and what I want. God is in the process. We're seeing it right now of bringing all of that down He's bringing out his sledgehammer and he's smashing to pieces right now everything that has been built by men in the name of apostles and prophets and evangelists and teachers who are building their own kingdoms and building their own ministries because God has not got what he wanted, which is a mature man. The measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ. Let's capture that. Let's capture that vision. Let's capture what God is after here. God is raising that up. I was listening to a podcast recently where the author, um, he wrote a book called The Great Dechurching in America. And he did this very extensive study to find out the great dechurching in America. And he says, we're currently in the largest and fastest religious shift in the history of our country. According to their study, it's very extensive. According to their, their scientific study, over 40 million Americans have left the church largely in the past 25 to 30 years. 40 million Americans. Now, he wanted you, just to, just to kind of get an idea of the scope of this, that's 1.5 times greater than, than, okay, so in other words, let me say it like this. You had the first great awakening in America. You had the second great awakening in America. You had all the Billy Graham crusades throughout his lifetime. If you were to take all of those that shifted the church or shifted America into the church, that, if you took that and you times it by 1.25, but put it in the reverse, it's kind of complicated, put it in the reverse, that's what the great dechurching in America is like. 1.5 times greater in the reverse of the greatest moves of God in our nation. See, we are living... Now, why is that? I think there's several reasons. One is, I think we're definitely living in the end times. We're definitely living in the times Paul talked about of the great falling away from the faith, that Paul talked about there would be a great falling away from the faith before the Lord returned. So we're we're definitely living in that time, but 40 million Americans, that's heartbreaking, isn't it? I think another reason is because Many have been hurt and wounded in the church, rightly so. I understand why, you you know, if you've been hurt and wounded in the church, you would not want to, you would be very reluctant to go back into the church. I I get that. But I, I think one reason, one reason why a lot of people are not going to church, they're just bored. And I think one of the reasons they're bored is they don't really see 
God's eternal purpose for the church. God's eternal purpose for the church is not for you to come as a consumer to be entertained and to sit in service for two hours, listen to a message, and go home. God, the church is meant to be the place where you experience God. You experience God individually. You experience God interdependently, where we are the living, breathing expression of the organic life of Jesus Christ in the earth. And so God is in this, this mode of recovery to get us back to that very foundation the very foundation of Jesus Christ. Now, I, I'm going I'm to make this message two parts because I'm not going to get into the whole deconstruction part, is, is, but I'll, I'll cover that next week. But for us to get, for, and just, I'll, I'll just introduce it just real quick, but for us to get into what God intends, I mean, it, gosh, I, I just want us to be, God, give us that revelation because when you see it, when you see it and what God wants, it is a beautiful vision. It's not boring at all. It is life. It's the expression of life among a people who are gathered together under the headship of Jesus Christ. It is a very beautiful thing. It is not organized man-made religion. It is not an institution. It is not an organization. It is not that. It is the living, organic life of Christ expressed through a people who are revealing Christ in their city and in their community and revealing Christ in the nations. That is what God is jealous for. And so just to kind of uh, give us an introduction into next week is for us to get into that a lot of the mindsets, even, even though we, we are far from an organized religion, but we still, even no matter where we came from or how we were raised, we still in our minds have this cultural mindset of consumer Christianity that has been pushed, put into us, and that has to come down so that we can be that body that expresses the life of Jesus Christ together. And so I'm going to end this message today by going back to that prayer I, I prayed a, a minute ago. I'm going to pray this for us so that we might, we might become what God wants here in fullness. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the head of the church. And you are the head of this church. We as your body your ecclesia, come under your headship together to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, to express your life together, to love, encourage, and care for one another, and to follow you wherever you go. Lord, I pray that you would make us jealous Lord, you would make us jealous so that we could become this in a much greater measure, the gathering together of your ecclesia, that we could become that in maturity and in fullness, we pray. I pray that you would give us a revelation of this, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We'll go ahead and in the online portion here. All right, so Larry, could you sing us in uh, like Amazing Grace or Lord I Love You or I Surrender All? Let's just stand and uh, just, just wait on the Lord. Just wait on the Lord.